Hi, I'm Adam Fish. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Draw It to Know It. Um, I'm also a practicing neurologist. I graduated from Indiana University in 2004 from medical school, and then I did neurology training at WashU until 2008 and sleep medicine after that. Um, I'm very excited to be talking to you today about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the concept of deep learning. So um, when we think about learning, uh, we can really break it down into two different types, flash memorization and deep learning strategies. And the best way to kind of imagine it is that flash memorization is, is a photograph. It's a static image. Deep learning strategies are movies. Um, and the key difference that we're looking at there is that in a movie, there's a story. There's a beginning, there's a middle and an end that allows us to anticipate things. It allows us to group various concepts. And at the end of the day, it's far more memorable than a static image of which we can only sort of visually inspect. Um, how this applies to medical school is that medical school is not complicated but it is arduous in that there's a sheer tonnage of information that has to be learned. Um, a lot of it's forgotten, uh, but our goal is to learn it, retain it, internalize it, and use it in our careers. Um, it's quite sad the amount of information that you'll consume uh, and store briefly and then forget. Um, and, and we don't want to do that. That's not our goal. Um, it is definitely shown that people who apply deep learning strategies for information retain the material far better, uh, no matter what that deep learning strategy is. For my part, I started with the concept of drawing out information when I was asked to teach the 12 cranial nerves um, to a group of residents. Um, I spent a month building this monograph of the origin, course, and termination of each of the 12 cranial nerves. And then when I handed it in, uh, my mentor, Bill DeMeyer, said, that's great, go put that on the shelf. Now I want you to teach the material. And so I took to this sort of chalk talk style, which was you stand at the whiteboard with markers and you stand, you deliver the information. And when I went to do that, I realized that even after building this entire book of information, I hadn't really learned uh, the material. And that was why it was so important that I ultimately taught it. In order to learn the material, um, I had to apply many different principles, uh, one of which is a key strategy called chunking, which is taking information, breaking it into packets, and each of those packets has a through line, and then you're really learning similarities and dissimilarities between core information within that packet. Uh, one of the examples is chunking, which uh, we use for telephone numbers. So um, if you have a series of 10 digits and you break it into three digits for the area code, three for a, a leader and four for the tail, it's much easier to remember those 10 digits than if you remember them as just a sequence of 10 different numbers. Um, before we go into deep learning strategies and how they're applied in learning uh, medical education, I think it's really important that we have some concept of what what is the underpinnings of memory. And that's something called the memory scaffold. Um, the memory scaffold is this beautiful construct that information comes in through a modality. Uh, modality could be visual, auditory, olfactory, even emotional. Um, that information goes to its primary uh, receptive area, and then it goes into something called the PAPE circuit. And the PAPE circuit is responsible for processing that information and turning it into uh, no longer just a piece of sensory 
neuronal firing, but now something that can actually be stored. And then it gets sent back out to the area of the brain from whence it came. Why this is an important construct is that it tells us we can use all of our brain to remember items if we pay attention to all of our faculties. So most of us, when we're learning anything, we, we use visual inspection and we may use a sub vocal kind of voicing where we're coming up with a list and we're repeating it to ourselves again and again, but we're not paying attention to all of our different faculties. And one of the key ones is the frontal lobe's ability for executive function, for task sequencing. So creating an actual ABCD ordering of items. And so we'll get into that when we talk about how we take information and create story from it. Um, the way to best sort of represent uh, what's happening with the memory scaffold is to think about visual information. So visual information comes in through the eye, it lands on the retina, and then it gets spit back to the thalamus, and then ultimately to uh, the V1 area of the occipital lobe. It then gets pushed forward through different processing areas where its shape, color, um, even its depth, even its depth can all be processed in various regions of the occipital cortex. But ultimately that visual memory is stored somewhere in the occipital cortex. And the more that we think about an item, the stronger the bond between the PAPE circuit and that item is. So the PAPE circuit will process the memory, but it will also form this branch, this scaffolding that can be enhanced, can be thickened, can grow every time we think about the item. People like to talk about the file clerk. So if the hippocampus is a file clerk and a memory is a file, then everywhere else in the brain is a cabinet. And we get to fill those cabinets and organize them if we're, if we're intentional about the way that we learn. So if we, if we use our visual cortex, then every time we have a visual memory and we imagine that memory and we think about its visual aspects, we're creating a branch, we're thickening the branch and we're using it. But if we think about smells, if we think about emotionality, if we think about auditory aspects like diction, the way things sound, if they sound funny, if they sound silly, whatever it is, we can create memories that way too. And as I mentioned, this idea of story, this idea of guiding along in a step-by-step -step fashion, that can be its own memory. It can be its own packet. If you think about uh, playing the piano, um, when you first learn a sequence, it's, it's difficult some, for some more than others, of course, right? But ultimately you play it very, very quickly. And it's not that your fingers necessarily got faster. It's that the sequence of neuronal firing became more predictable, so predictable that your brain ultimately creates something called a motor engram. And that motor engram basically is just a play button of a series of actions. So rather than having to go through each of those each of those steps every time you want to play the piano uh, of a particular song, your brain fires that motor engram and you breeze through it, so much so that you even stop thinking about it. We can do that with medical information as well, but we have to have the steps. Uh, we have to have an actual construct to, of which to learn them, and that's the deep learning strategy. So I started with the the drawing as as the vehicle for deep learning strategy, but really there's so much more to it. And so for the past 15 years, we've really been working on all of medical and biological science and putting concepts, pathways, structures, whatever it is through this distillation of information and then this rebuilding of it into a series of dots that connect together into a visual representation, but do so in sequence. So um, the work that I've done is to take 
any information, start with a blank page, lay out the simplest, most broad concepts first, and then create images that are reproducible and rehearsable that are really just packets of information. So when you start on something, it's always a struggle, right? But once you learn the sequence that happens, and once you hear the information that's related to it, then every time you do it, you're rehearsing all of that information and you're becoming faster and faster. And that area, that memory scaffold uh, that, that goes to that engram gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So you can already see how this takes shape with the cranial nerves. You're going to first break them into their three different families. You're going to define the through line of that family. You're going to, you're going to indicate who exemplifies that and who disobeys that, those laws. And you're going to do this in a sequence that you can actually rehearse. Um, the visual is simply a way to connect a series of dots. It's, again, it's not about an artistic approach, although sometimes accuracy is incredibly important. And so those dots have to be placed in the right position. Um, but what we're doing, for instance, with Draw to Know It is, is not creating some illustrative uh, representation, but rather a mechanism to contain a story. Uh, before I end, what, I, what I'd like to impress upon you is, is that medical education is not written in a way such that you can easily break the information down and rebuild it for yourself. Authors don't think like learners generally. They're not concerned with your ability to take the information uh, and make it your own. They're concerned with their accuracy, their, co their completeness. Um, and so when you're approaching the information, you have to be willing to um, find resources that are instructive rather than just didactic and also be willing to create some story for yourself, to put things together for yourself, to take this attentive, active approach. So at Draw to Know It, we focus on instruction. We focus on this is what, you, this is what comes first, next, everything like that. But ultimately, what a learner should do is make something their own. Um, because as a learner, you're going to have all kinds of different experiences. You're going to learn from professors. You're going to learn from YouTube videos, you're going to learn from various resources, but ultimately, if you can make the knowledge your own and you can create a story for yourself, that's what you're going to carry with you far, far beyond when the memory itself, the short-term kind of memory, working memory component of it starts to fail. And I think this uh, information that you're going to learn in medical school is unbelievably uh interesting and compelling and the more that you understand it the more interesting it will become for myself personally i could not understand why we were looking at embryology after learning almost everything i could about gross anatomy and neuroanatomy and now i understand that embryology is the origin of everything it's beautiful it, it makes sense of why things landed where they did um, biochemistry is so much more fun when you understand the clinical impact of some of the dysregulation of, of, of the biochemistry. So I hope this has been uh, enjoyable for you. I, and I hope that you can change the way that you learn to a more active learning approach because it'll be way more satisfying in the end. Uh, thanks for your time and attention.